In the olden days, a pirate looked like this, and he stole treasure, jewelry, gold, and silver. But nowadays, a pirate doesn't need a black eye patch, a sword, or even a wooden leg. All you need is a floppy disk and maybe a little ingenuity. We'll take a look at software piracy coming up on the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is brought to you in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Popular Computing, the magazine that gives readers an understanding of the technology and applications of microcomputers and software in office, home, and classroom. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Schiffe, and this is Gary Kildall. And Gary, the subject today is software piracy. Now, Gary, I know a guy who at home has this tremendous collection of software disks piled high, and he proudly boasts to me, I didn't buy a one of them. Now, from your perspective as somebody in the software business, how serious is the piracy problem? Well, Stuart, it's a very serious issue. Uh, it, the problem is that as a software producer, you can't tell how much you're going to sell versus how much is going to be stolen. And as a result, the prices just go up uh, to take care of that difference. Now, if we can control piracy, then we can control the customer base we're working with, and we know how many we're going to sell, and as a result, that the industry will stabilize at, at probably a lower price level, much like the record industry. So I think the issue right now, in terms of mass marketing of software, is just how much can you, can you control in terms of the piracy issue. Okay, on today's program, we're going to meet a software pirate. We'll meet somebody who sells a utility that helps you defeat copy protection. We'll meet a lawyer who raided one of the largest pirate groups here in the Bay Area, and we'll talk to a software company executive. Now, some people say one of the problems with piracy is that software is so expensive in the first place. Why is it so expensive? We have a report. Behind much of the discussion about the rights and wrongs of piracy is a recurring question. Why do software programs cost so much? What can possibly justify the $500 price tag on a floppy disk that took a few minutes to duplicate? In fact, except for the box it comes in, it looks like any other floppy disk. But for the publisher, the production costs of that disk are easily measured. The biggest expense, of course, is in programming development. A top category word processor can take a year and a half of development time, relying on a team of over 60 people. The development team shares activities, source code development, screens and help systems, and instruction manuals are all interdependent at various stages. Prestigious software houses also stress their documentation and on-screen tutorials, all part of extensive customer product training. The impetus for the product's design comes from a large marketing department. Advertising, package design, and merchandising devices add another expensive layer of cost. And when you add the extra costs of disk reproduction, typesetting, printing, and distribution, the overall cost of getting the program to the customer rises to several million dollars. To an advanced user who buys software by word of mouth or by trying out a friend's copy, the elaborate ad campaigns and customer coddling may seem like overkill. On the other hand, the first-time computer user may demand it. In any case, the expenses are considerable and genuine. But for the user, that doesn't make the prices of software any easier to pay. With us now is Mark Pump. Mark is the president of Alpha Logic Business Systems, makers of a utility called Locksmith that helps you copy software. And next to Mark is Smith McKeithen, vice president of Activision, a company which makes software and probably would rather not have it copied. Gary? You know, Stuart, uh, there, there is a difference between the audio and video dubbing or copying business, I suppose, and, and uh, software in the software industry because the uh, 20th copy of a, of a program or data is just as good as the very first copy. Uh, now, I think of uh, something like uh, Activision as really being in the ROM cartridge business, but I guess you've moved away from that. How do you view the whole piracy issue from Activision's standpoint? Well, Gary, the, the issue of piracy is one of our intellectual property being essentially ripped off by people who haven't put the intellectual or financial <laughs> investment into creating that. It takes from 1,500 to 2,000 hours 
to create a piece of quality software. And that's an investment just like the investment that an author makes mm -hmm. in writing a book or a producer or director makes in putting on a, a movie. And when someone takes that product and copies it and tries to market for cents on the dollar, it means that the creator of the software, such as a David Crane in our business, um, is working for nothing. Well, do you differentiate then between someone who's going to copy and then resell uh, versus someone who's going to copy and give to, their, give to their friend? or? No, I don't make any difference okay. between the two because I believe that both people suffer from essentially ethical blinders. Mm -hmm. It's as if uh, I took a Porsche that I never wanted to drive, but I slipped it past a security guard. Now, even if I didn't drive it or if I gave it to a friend, that would be stealing. And that's the same thing that happens to a company like Activision when someone uses its software in an unauthorized manner. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, Mark, from your side, are, don't users sometimes have a legitimate need to make copies of a program? Uh, yes, without a doubt, the user has a legitimate need to make a copy of a program. Uh, if he's uh, using his original copy and for some reason the copy becomes unusable, he's left without a, a program that his business might very well depend on for its day-to-day -day operations. Uh, being, without a, being without the software is in many ways uh, being without an important part of his company. Well, it seems like there's also just a, a very basic need that some people have in taking a diskette and copying it over to hard disk. It's a very simple operation that you need to do a lot of times, say, on an IBM PC. Yes. Okay, now, now tell us about Locksmith. What does it do? Well, lo Locksmith is a program that makes an identical copy of the original disk. Uh, unlike uh, what you might have heard about breaking a piece of software, breaking the protection, which involves uh, removing the protection and in most cases, removing any serial numbers and copyright notices that the software contains. Locksmith makes an identical copy, retains the protection, it retains the copyright notices, retains the serial numbers. It makes an identical copy, an identical protected copy of the original piece of software. Okay, now Mark, I think you have here in the, in the Apple a piece of software which we don't want to identify, but you're going to show us this piece, uh, you're going to make a copy of it with Locksmith, even though we otherwise could not make a copy of this disk, right? Yes, lo Locksmith, because of the way it works, it, it uh, is not a very fast utility. It takes between eight and ten minutes to make a backup copy of a, of a piece of software. This does not easily lend itself to the pirate uh, who needs to make copies much faster. Typically, the pirate, for this reason, will break the software. Uh, to uh, Still, a name in a backup is, uh, for many people, a lot cheaper, I guess, than going out and paying the extra $40, right? Well, is that, uh, yes, yes, yeah. it, is, it is, of course, used for that. The idea of the backup disk is you make one backup, store the original away, and use the backup. Mm -hmm. When your backup becomes unusu un unusable, you have the original to make another backup copy. Isn't that the real issue, that, that uh, if you could control uh, the use of, say, locksmith, then, uh, <laughs> then it would be, uh, the things would be a lot better. You say, well, this is only used for backup purposes, not, for u not used for distribution of additional software. So some people would say, say, the locksmith would be, um, say, a pirate's tool for, for copying software. How what would be your view of that? Well, in, in our advertisements, and in fact in the manual, we encourage mm -hmm. users to use it only for legal purposes. Of mm -hmm. course, there are people who use it for pirating, mm -hmm. even though there are much better ways to pirate software than using locksmith. Okay, show us how you make a copy sure. of this uncopyable disk then. Uh, basically, you identify the, uh, the disk drive that your original is in, the disk drive that your copy diskette is in, the range of tracks that you want to copy, a few other questions answered, a prompt here to insert the disks, and it starts copying. Now, that, that seems awfully easy, uh, Smith, from your point of view. Well, how do you react to a product like that? Well, the problem with a product like this is that this kind of product just facilitates people um, getting into intellectual property and stealing it. It makes it much too simple for them to do it. And if, in fact, a user of, say, one of Activision's products has a problem with this product, he only need call us on an 800 toll-free line or send the damaged product in and we'll replace it. We have a, we have a year-long warranty on our products. We stand behind them. We receive over 3,000 pieces of mail a week from people who use Activision products and want to know about upcoming products. And these people have formed a bond with us which we will not ignore by not giving them good service. And all the responsible software manufacturers follow that same trend. So there's no need for, for a, a product like this in the, in the event of someone having a damaged product that they want to use. Well, again, I think it goes back to the issue that maybe the software providers, people who write the software initially, aren't really uh, allowing for the possibility of a backup 
for a legitimate user. At least I, you know, I've run into that particular problem myself, but there, you go back to the, the diskette over the hard disk. There, there's programs I just simply can't use because I have no way of getting them onto, the, onto a hard disk system, which is where, where all my program, uh, programs are located. But have you talked to the manufacturer about that? Well, sure. And then they say, well, they have no way of, uh, of controlling the uh, distribution of that kind of thing. And a backup, again, opens up the possibility of, of, uh, of uh, illegitimate copying. Well, there, is, there may be a tension in the system, but the problem is that a, a product like this and, and the wide use, the wider than we like to have use of illegitimate copies, really can, spo in the long range, spoil the, the production of creative, mm -hmm. creative intellectual product Absolutely. for everybody. Absolutely. And that's a zero-sum game. Mm -hmm. Well, Mark, what about that? I mean, do you have any feedback on how your product is, in fact, being used? Uh, well, without programs like Locksmith, pirating would, in fact, still exist. Uh, sophisticated computer users, so-called hackers, uh, don't need programs like Locksmith. Uh, they have the technical expertise to break or remove the protection from the, from the software without actually making an identical copy of the, of the original disk. Uh, I'd say that's true for real dyed in the world. Uh, die in the wool pirates, but I think that they're. I mean, I've, I've experienced this myself because I have a 15 year old son who's involved. Now, I, I've tried very hard to keep him <laughs> from copying a software, and he's very good at that. But I see a community of, of say, relatively uns unsophisticated users of that age group that do some copying. And, and, uh, and I don't think in many cases they would be doing it if they didn't have programs available to, to unlock some of these things. <coughs> well, one, one of the <coughs> largest users of Locksmith is schools. Uh, educational software is not cheap, uh, and teachers feel reluctant to take their only copy of an expensive piece of software, put it in their students' hands, and allow it to be either stolen or damaged mm -hmm. by uh, sharp objects, magnetic mm -hmm. fields, what have you. Most schools that buy Locksmith use Locksmith to archive. They make a backup copy of the original, archive the original, and let the students use the backup copy. Thank you, gentlemen. Now, in just a minute, we're going to meet Captain Crunch, one of the original pirates. We'll meet a current-day pirate, and we'll meet a lawyer who busted the West Coast computer connection, an alleged band of pirates. That's coming up next. With us now is Captain Crunch, whose real name is John Draper. John was called a pirate. Uh, when that referred to stealing long-distance telephone calls rather than software. And sitting next to John is Neil Smith. Neil is a partner in the firm of Limbach, Limbach & Sutton. And Neil might be called a pirate buster these days. Gary? You know, John, I guess the uh, uh, phone freaking of the 60s is sort of uh, the computer hacking of today's uh, date. And you were, you were, I guess, what they'd call a, a phone cracker, and you would got into the system and so forth. I guess you'd be considered a pirate in those days. Uh, now, you've moved into being a software vendor now. You've, you're the author of Easy Writer. You're working on a lot of Mac software. How do you feel about software piracy? Well, it's definitely a problem. Uh, and uh, the problem is probably because of the very high cost of software. And the reason for that, of course, is that uh, programmers can't work for nothing. And the cost of development is very, very high. And uh, with that in consideration, uh, uh, this is the reason why uh, a lot of programmers are reluctant to come out with good software. Mm -hmm. Freeware seems to be the best way to go uh, all around. It eliminates a lot of the problems caused by, uh, caused by the copy protection uh, thing. Now, freeware has the problem of the support around it, though. Also. Right, exactly. And uh, you, must, uh, you must really support the product in order to come mm -hmm. out with freeware. It takes a lot of dedication. For, and only for that. those people <laughs> that mail in their 20 or $30, $30 checks will get, the, will get the support and the licensing to run the program. Mm -hmm. Neil, would you agree about this problem of expensive software? Well, I think we have a somewhat of a chicken or egg problem because if you look at the marketing of software, you'd find that one of the reasons software has to be marketed so high is to, def to recoup those high development costs, the amount of money it takes to develop that software in order, in, order to, in order to get good software that has the bugs worked out. Or even a reasonable ad campaign. To take well, that's it right, to do thousand, that. Thousand and if the manufacturer could mm -hmm. count on everybody who uses programs buying one, that cost could drop dramatically. Mm -hmm. And I think in many cases uh, we're fooling ourselves we're fooling ourselves in blaming the high price because in many cases if that could be spread 